Let's bow together in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for what a powerful message you have just delivered to us. That though the mountains will give way, and the things that we relied upon will one day disappear. God, that you are our refuge. You are our help in our time of trouble. And you are our mighty fortress. Father, we thank you that your truth lives forever. And Father, we pray that your truth would live forever in each one of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's really a great time to be able to gather together as God's people. It's just once a year on a Sunday morning where we come together as one church. For some of us, it's great because the service starts later than normal. But for others of you, you have to pray harder because it starts earlier than you normally do. And so whether it's later or earlier, we're especially glad that you're here this morning. Our theme for this year is 2020 vision. Living with God's perspective. You see, the Apostle Paul says that we were once darkness. Separated from God. Objects of his judgment. Disinterested in the things related to Jesus. But by the grace of God, we are now light in the Lord. And so as we are light in the Lord, Paul says, live as children of light and learn to discover what pleases God. And that's our hope for 2020. I have very bad vision. I shared that with our English ministry last week. I need strong lenses. I need more light. I need big font. Otherwise, I can't see. And so I look forward to having 2020 vision in heaven. And because this is a largely Asian church, I think many of you wish the same thing. But even more than that, God wants us to have 2020 vision where we live with His perspective. Where we see him as he reveals himself to us. Where we see our life the way that he does. And then as we live as children of light, and as we learn to live what pleases God, then the brilliance of God's one and only Son will shine in the darkness of our world. And others will come to embrace Jesus as the light of the world. We have a family in our church that recently went on a cruise on the eastern part of our nation. And on this cruise, there were families of all ages. Couples that have been married for a number of years. Some have invariably were newly wed. But older were old wed, maybe 10 years and 20 years. 
And so they wanted to find out what couple had been married the longest period of time. The couple that had been married the longest period of time was not 30 years. It wasn't even 50 years. It was 65 years. Married to one another, the same spouse, for 65 years. And not only that, but they're enjoying life on a cruise. And so when they spotted this couple, the, the host of this event said, I, I want to find out how you have succeeded in having such a vibrant, lasting, wonderful marriage. And so the husband spoke up. He said, we have a very simple rule in our household. I, as the husband, the leader of the household, I make all the big decisions in our family. The da decisions. Those are the ones that I make. My wife, she makes all the little decisions. The shao decisions. <laughs> the small one, the little one. And so the host was curious. He says, well, what's an example of a, of a big decision? And so the husband said, well, up to this point, we haven't had any big decisions. <laughs> If your husband doesn't understand that, don't tell him. And I've already told that story to the English congregation, but I still saw people laughing. Because every time I think about that story, that Frank and Gloria told me, I still laugh. You see, we all need a framework. We need a grid that helps us to make choices in life. What's the secret to a lasting, enduring relationship? What is absolutely necessary to a rewarding, satisfying relationship with God? And I would say that it boils down to how we make choices. It's what we decide at the especially critical moments of our life that determine whether our faith will rise or whether our faith will collapse. You see, what we decide at those critical junctures will have either a developing effect on our faith or a devastating effect on our relationship with God. We're going to see that you could have the same observation. You could gather the same amount of information. You could look at the exact same set of facts. But come up with wildly different conclusions. Because it all depends on our vision. It matters about your perspective. The framework that helps you to make decisions. As we face challenges, what do we see? When you encounter a roadblock, how do you respond? When you step into a, a, a juncture of your life, that becomes a crossroad of your faith. What's the choice that you make? What do we focus on? We must focus on the faithful Lord above us more than the fearful enemies around us. 
We must concentrate on the God who keeps every one of his promises rather than the threats around us that jeopardize and, and terrify the depth of who we are. And we've got to bank on God's faithfulness more than the enemies around us to experience His good promises. Because what matters more than the size of our opponent is the strength of our God. That's what we're going to discover this morning. What matters more than the size of our opponent is the strength of the God that we worship. And so we can trust in God's faithfulness to us. But as we do, we must also guard against our unfaithfulness to Him. We live in a poll taking society. We we always see polls about the decisions that our president makes. Do you support that decision? Are you against it? How do you feel about the economy of our nation? Who do you plan to vote for in the next presidential election? Where do you want to go for lunch today? And that's a decision that every one of us considers every Sunday. And we usually base our decision based upon the poll of our friends. And typically, the majority of people decide where we're going to go. Today, we've made the decision for you. You will experience a free lunch at Bread of Life Church. The majority have decided. We will eat here together. But more often than not, when you live faithfully to Jesus, if you are wholeheartedly devoted to God, if you are bent on trusting the power of God's Spirit, then you're not going to be part of the majority. You're going to find yourself pushed to the edges. You're going to be going against the flow. Standing out like a sore thumb. Maybe even laughed at by people around us. And so the title for today's talk is Minority Rules. Because we're going to see today that while the majority typically makes the decision, the majority is not always right. In fact, instead of being on the side of what most everyone else thinks, truth is going to be on the side of the minority. And the minority has a couple rules to live by. The first is we could do anything because God is accessible to us. That you could do whatever God wants you to do because God is with you. Regardless of what anyone else thinks. A second rule is we must obey God's commands because we are accountable to the Lord. You see, God makes incredible promises to you. He has a future that is as bright as the brightest planet. 
But because we are accountable to God, we must live in obedience to Him. The promises of God do have conditions. And so I'd like you to turn or tap over in your Bibles to the Book of Numbers. One of the very first books in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And so we going to look at the 13th and 14th chapters of this book. In verses 1 to 25 of chapter 13, we're going to see that the Lord promises this enormous gift for his people. It's a promise as old as Abraham. It has been long awaited. But then we're going to see in the balance of our passage that the leaders face this massive barrier over God's provision. And in fact, the barrier is so huge that it's going to require the faith and the confidence of his people. The Lord promises an enormous gift for his people. They simply have to go and take the land. And having just rescued his own chosen people out of the land of Egypt after four centuries of excruciating, terrible bondage. God makes an incredible command, obviously plain for his people. I've already given you this land. You don't have to sweat. But you do have to go in and take the land. Take a look at Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe send one of its leaders. You see, God's people literally stand at the brink of an incredibly historic, thrilling, groundbreaking moment. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, Moses underlines the point that God has given us this land. You just have to go up and take possession of the land. And again, he reiterates the Lord God has given you this land that he's promised to the ancestors. He simply says, you don't have to sweat. There's no need to be afraid. And although not defiant, the people of God are reluctant. And so they hear what God says to them through Moses. You just have to go and take the land. You don't have to sweat. Just go. But then some of the guys said, well, let's wait. We have a counter proposal. Rather than just rushing in, why don't we have a delegation of scouts? Eagle scouts. Sharply focused spies. 
people that we could send into the land just to make sure that you know this is the right land that we're at they didn't have Google Maps back then they can plug in promised land and expect them to get there okay and so they said let's just make sure that this is the land that God has promised us. And so, this is plan B, as it were. And Moses chooses one leader out of each of the 12 tribes. To check out the land that God has already given to them. Verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of Land do they live in? Is it good or is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or are they fortified? How about the soil? Is it fertile or is it poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land and parenthetically, it was the season for the first ripe grapes. 就是说看看他们有什么东西,这个土地有没有收成,所以去到那里,其实那个时候刚好是葡萄出熟的时候. And so the twelve spies are gathered together. And we're given an assignment. Moses says, check out the land. Make sure the land is really good. Because God has promised a fertile, productive, incredible piece of real estate. But I also want you to scope out the people. Are they weaklings? Or are they strong and massive? How about the walls of the city? Will they protect them in battle? Or is the landscape easy pickings where we could just rush through and take the land? And in verses 21 to 25, the 12 spies did everything that God had commanded them through Moses. Along with scouting out the land and Taking a bunch of grapes. Have you bought grapes at Costco recently? I bought some last week. Red grapes. $5.99. They dropped from $9.99. And not only that, in fact, I was going to bring you some this morning, Bill, but I forgot. <laughs> The grapes are huge. They're firm. And they're sweet. Are you hungry? <laughs> it's a ripe season for grapes. When the spies were sent out into the land, they make the grapes over at Costco look like raisins. <laughs> because this cluster of grapes was so huge <laughs> that they had to put this cluster of grapes on a pole. And Bill and I, who are both physically strong, <laughs> would take this pole and bring the grapes back to where everyone else was. 
One grape is like ten meals. <laughs> they did exactly what God wanted them to do. From a behavioral, external, outside standpoint, they did what God required of them. And I'm sure there's times when God promises you this enormous, huge blessing from heaven. God wants to set you free from anxiety. He wants to give you the peace that guards and protects your heart. But God says you've got to offer up that anxiety to him. You've got to trust in his protection. It's, po it's possible that we've been working overtime to get God's approval. Where we imagine that our acceptance before God in heaven depends on how good of a person I am. But God says, no, my son has already paid the price for you. And I want you to simply trust in my provision for you through Jesus on the cross. Maybe we approach God saying, God, this is what I want to do in 2020. And God, I want you to rubber stamp and to bless and to honor and to multiply these plans. And we'll never say it like this. But we think of God as a genie in a lamp. And we rub that lamp. And we call it prayer. And so we rub that lamp really, really hard. And it's all about God giving us what we want. But God comes back and says, Dan, I, I'm not into blessing what you want. I want you to want what I want. And then we'll talk business. Every day that you and I live, and every single day that we live is a gift from God. It's a God-given sacred opportunity to trust and obey. You know, I saw a sign in our neighborhood the other day. It's a spirit assembly. 8.30. And then it said, Kinder 2021 parent. And I thought, wow, is this a church? I mean, we want the Spirit of God to be in our assembly. We sing songs that say, Come, Holy Spirit. We say, Spirit of God, we welcome you. We want to be spirit enabled and spirit motivated. And maybe as we think of the new year 2020 into 2021, we want to be kinder parents. We want to treat our children with kindness and generosity. But then take a look at where I saw this sign. Vista Grande Elementary. It's like, oh, it's not a church. It's a school. It's where our sons Christopher and Jonathan went to. And so when they talk about spirit assembly, obviously they're not talking the same kind of spirit we talk about. 
They're talking about school spirit. You could buy a t-shirt that says Visegrande Elementary. You can sing a song that says Go Voyagers. They want to drum up school spirit. And they're not helping me as a mom or dad to be kinder to my kids. These are incoming kindergarten families. That if they have a son or daughter who's going to be a kindergartner in the coming school year, there's an information session available. Oh, same information. We read the exact same words. But it's all about context. It's all about the setting by which we look at this set of circumstances. The Lord promises this enormously huge gift for his people. As old as the patriarch Abraham. But the leaders face a massive barrier over the Lord's provision. Because the leaders we will see have the same set of observations and information. But they come up with dramatically different conclusions. It's just a handful of people that say whatever God says, He can do because God is with us. While everyone else says, well, it's not that easy. Chapter 13, starting at verse 27, Moses adds an audio track to our story. The 12 spies go back to Moses and Aaron and the entire community. They show them this cluster of grapes. Pomegranates and figs. It's confirmation, visible, tangible evidence of the fertility of this land. But then listen to the report, verse 27. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. What God said is exactly right. This is a land that is unlike any other land in the world. Verse 28. But the people who live there, oh, scary, overwhelming, people you don't want to mess with. The people who live there are powerful. And the cities, they're fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. You see, the essence of the report is, well, we have good news and bad news. The good news is the land is good. Look at these grapes. The land is really flowing with milk and honey. It's lush and successful and easy to produce wonderful produce. But then there's bad news. The people there are incredibly strong. 
The cities are not small, easy to take, but they're huge and hard to conquer. They're not defenseless and weak, but they have walls that are fortified and, and overbearing to what we could ever do. So their conclusion is there's no way we can go in there. It would be a suicide mission. They would literally crush us. Forget it. There's no way that we could just go in there and take the land. We're done here. Uh, We're not going to go in and do what God commands. That's dumb. And they said, We're not dumb. And we don't want to die. So we're not going to do what God commands. And at this point, a man whose name means faithful. Wholehearted, bold and brave. At this point, Caleb stands up. And he speaks out. And he offers a completely different perspective. Verse 30. Then Caleb quieted or silenced the people before Moses. He said, We should go up and take possession of the land. For we can certainly do it. He says, Let's go up at once and occupy the land. For we are well able to overcome it. <coughs> you see, with a posture of wholehearted, fearless obedience, Caleb declares his resolution to do what God says. Because the rule of the minority is that we can do whatever God wants because God is accessible to us. And you would think that when they hear Caleb give this incredibly profound, faith-stirring speech, that the rest of the spies would say, hey, you know what, you're right, Caleb. What were we thinking? But that's not what happens. Take a look at 31. They've already made up their mind. We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we. You ever been around someone like that? You have a Caleb spirit inside of you. And you said, you know, if God promises, if God commands, then you can do it. Because God is accessible to you. God is with you. God will never command you to do something that he doesn't enable you to accomplish. But then that person says, no, we can't do this. We can't attack those people. They're too strong for us. And rather than concentrating on the almighty, faithful God above them, they zoom in on the powerful and fearful enemies around them. It's not a mighty fortress. Who is their God? It's a terrible enemy around them. That paralyzes their faith. 
And so while Caleb is absolutely sure that they can get the job done by conquering these people, 那个时候, the ten other spies are just as certain that if they go, they are gone. 其他的四个探子说, 如果我们去的话, and so it gets worse in 32 and 33. 在, uh, uh, and they spread that is these ten other spies that said, we cannot do this. They spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They started to become less observational, reporting the facts, and more putting a bent to it with their own prejudicial belief that they could not do what God commands. The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim. And we seem like grasshoppers in their in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. You see, zooming in on what's gigantic and massive to them. These pessimists fail to see the grandeur and the majesty of the Lord God of Israel that had just delivered them out of Egypt. Who had just parted the Red Sea. Who had miraculously provided for their needs time and time again. And they were literally shaking in their sandals. Because they focused on the giants around them. Then the Lord God of heaven above them. The leaders forgot that the strength of their covenant-keeping God matters so much more than the size of these law-breaking enemies. In fact, their vision is so bad that when they look in a mirror, if they did a selfie of themselves, they saw a grasshopper. They saw a cockroach. They saw something that you go. Harder. You see an insect that you don't want, you want to kill it. You might pray for it before you kill it. But we scream and then we squash. And rather than seeing themselves the way that God sees them, their vision became so warped. Their vision became so blinded that they didn't see themselves as God's chosen people. They didn't see themselves as the recipients of this enormously huge promise from the only one true God. But they, they saw themselves as a grasshopper to be smashed. And they were absolutely sure, certain that that's the way the Canaanites had seen them. You see, rising up like Caleb, there are occasions when we could see God with unmistakable clarity. His will for you is obvious. What he expects of you is crystal clear. But then there's giants. And there's obstacles. And we begin to talk to ourselves and we say, Self. We can't do this. And we may not say that we feel like a grasshopper, but we don't feel like that person who could say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. 
We may not see ourselves as a little insect to be smashed, but we could easily forget that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Swipe over to chapter 14. As we turn the page to the next chapter, this split verdict among the leadership. Goes deeper and wider. On one side is sheer panic and total madness. Because of their unbelief, they said, we can't do this. And instead of moving ahead to the promised land, the majority experiences this mental, spiritual breakdown. Chapter 14, verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and they wept aloud. This is the entire nation that had just been delivered out of Egypt. That had just safely passed through the Red Sea. Some estimates are 2.5 million people at this point. This massive gathering of humanity. And I can't even imagine what it was like for them to weep aloud. And to raise their voices. And all the Israelites, verse 2, all of them grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt, or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? I mean, at least we had meals. We were chained up as slaves. But at least we knew we were going to have some meals. And so then they said to each other, Hey, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. I mean, this never happens at Bread of Life Church. No one ever complains about the leadership. No one ever says, Oh, those leaders. Oh, we should just go back to where we came from. This is terrible. Look at this church lunch. The rice is cold. There's not enough vegetables. There's too many vegetables. I want fish. I want pork. Oh, let me pray for the food. <laughs> but thank God it, people never complain at Bread of Life. So it might be hard to relate to this passage. But just try to imagine with me. All the people are... <laughs> They're gone crazy. They're saying it's better if we were slaves. I'd rather be held captive by brutal people. What kind of God is this? That he would want us to die in the wilderness. That we would venture into a suicide mission and just be smashed on like grasshoppers. Moses, we're done with you. 
We're going to create a search committee for a new leader. A national search. Get rid of Aaron too. We don't like the way he speaks. Joshua, Caleb, you guys are losers. And so they're coming up with this brilliant plan. It's a revolution. Oh, and you know, the, the crazy thing is, that we read this historically, but sometimes this is our life personally. Because there are times in our life where we say, you know what, are you happy with where you are? And we find someone to commiserate and we grumble together. And we would say, yeah, I don't really, I'm not happy with my life with Jesus right now. Too many commands. He wants us to do things that I don't want to do. I want to go back to my non-Christian days. I want to make my own decisions. I'm going to walk away from this. And there are times when we find ourselves at a fork in the road where we experience a mental, spiritual, emotional breakdown. And we say, God, why did you bring me to this place? I thought you're the God who blesses. I thought you're the God who cares about my happiness. And we say, God, I'm done with you. I'm going to walk back to my old life and my old friends because at least they don't judge me. They don't say I'm praying for you as if I got the plague. And we say things that are dumb. So on the one side, there are those that say, God, what are you up to? I can't do this. But on the other side, there's this unflinching courage. This, this ability to say, well, you know, I can't, but God can. That says, I recognize that we are weak, but that's exactly, it sets God up for his strength. And while Moses and Aaron fall on their faces in prayer, Joshua and Caleb tear their clothes in heart-wrenching grief over the nation's unfaithfulness. Their faithlessness is breaking the hearts of the leaders. And so coupled with their actions, these two spies, Joshua and Caleb, reiterate that they can trust in God to faithfully do what he says. Take a look at verses 7 through 9. They said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land that we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. It's exactly what God promised. He didn't oversell it. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not, and do not be afraid of the people of this land. Because rather than the land swallowing us up, we're going to devour the land. Their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us, so do not be afraid of them. You see, the land that God promised is incredibly great. 
But there are conditions. 但是呢，是有条件的。To experience the blessing of God's promise. 是你要得到神的应许的话。It's not automatic. 并不是说自然这样子发生的。Joshua and Caleb said, "You've got to do what God says." 因为耶稣呀跟加勒说，神告诉你的，你要就是要怎么做。You can't revolt around against His will. 你不能去背叛他的旨意。You don't have to freak out. 你不用在在在那里好像不知道这。Because greater than the enemies around us is the God above us. 因为比这些仇敌更伟大的就是在。You see, they were preoccupied with the fierceness of their enemy. And they lost sight of the faithfulness of the God above them, the good, faithful God. So they said, "If God is pleased with you, if God is happy with you, if God is honored by your obedience, then just go and take it. Don't be afraid." 就是神所喜悦的，神所应许的，就进去就去拿去。And we would think that after this. Passionate plea from Joshua and Caleb. That the nation would rise up and tell oh, Joshua, Caleb, wow, way to deliver a talk. What were we thinking? Let's do exactly what God commands. But rather than dropping to their knees, 但是他们没有在那里呃跪下来 In brokenness before God, 在那里神在神面前破碎自己 They rise up with anger. 他们在那里非常站起来，非常愤怒 In verse ten, the whole assembly starts talking about stoning Joshua and Caleb. 第十节的地方说，会众们说用用石头打死他们两个人 And in response to their deepening unbelief. Verse 10 continues. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. 那个时候，神的荣光就在会幕里面向以色列众人显现。And God reveals His plan to destroy the people and to raise up a new nation with Moses. 就是神在那里说，我要从摩西的子孙里面兴起。And Moses says, Moses says, God, I I I submit my life to you, but God. I plead with you, don't do it. 但是神在呃摩西在神面前请求说，神呃耶和华，请你不要这样做。Because if you destroy your people, then the the people will hear about it, and they say, well, God made this great promise, but He couldn't deliver, so then He just wiped out His people. 因为如果你这样做的话，其他的民族都是说，哎，神你已经应许了要把这些百姓领出来，结果呢，因为你就没有成就你的应许，就把他们杀死。And Moses, with his knees before God and his face looking up to heaven, said, "God, on the basis of your mercy, forgive them, but you are a God of justice." 就是说，神啊，就是说，他跪下来说，神你饶恕他们，但是我知道你是一个公义的神。And so in verses 20 to 45 of chapter 14， 就是在呃十呃十四呃十四章呃最后的一一段。We see that the Lord does forgive them of their rebellion。我们看到从二十节到二十四十五节，神真的饶恕他们的。But then God also holds them accountable for their actions。但是神也是。And so God literally judges and destroys the ten spies that had revolted against His plan. 首先，神把这个十个探子在那里判断他们。And every person twenty and above who rebelled against God, they would eventually perish in the wilderness over the course of wandering for forty years. 他们在二十岁以上的，他们就不反抗神的，都是在在那里要死亡。And only Joshua and Caleb, 只有约书亚跟加勒 ，and those under the age of twenty would enter into God's promised land. 只有在二呃呃约书亚跟加勒跟二十岁以下的，他们才能进去。It's a sharp and staggering reversal. 这个是完全一个电的事事情转转转变很大的。Because Caleb had this unwavering confidence that they could defeat their enemy because of God's presence. 因为加勒有这个信心，他们可以战胜这些仇敌。But Moses will declare to the nation. 但是摩西就会在这个国家里面宣布。That they will lose to their enemy because of God's absence. 就是他们会在仇敌里面失败。
And too little, too late. Some of the leaders said, oh, we have this aha moment. Maybe we should go up and take the land. But the leader said, if you do, you're gone. If you go now, you will lose because God is now not with you. And they went presuming that God would be with them. And they experienced his judgment. You see, Caleb says, we can't lose because God is with us. But now Moses, to the leaders who have too little, too late for God, says to them, you can't win because the Lord is not with you. Grace and accountability always go together. You know, when we travel, we depend on Yelp to tell us where to eat. And we usually depend on friend recommendations. But those friend recommendations probably started with Yelp. And so you could, like our family, go to New York City. And like Helen and myself, you could say to our kids, Chris and John, hey, where should we eat? We're right here. And they could find a place like Total Ramen. In the heart of New York City. That you would have absolutely no idea about. <coughs> Only because of Yelp. And then one of our kids might say, wow, 5,423 reviews. Four stars. And then we hit direction, how do we get there? And the line was long. But the food was good. Or you can get to Portland, Oregon, like we've done. And you said, Where should we eat in Portland, Oregon? And we said, Let's go to Screen Door. Deep fried chicken. Oh, and waffles. Oh, and maple syrup. Oh, Stuff I never eat. Oh, but I'm on vacation. <laughs> 7,038 reviews. Oh, Four and a half stars. Oh, How do we get there? Uh, you could even go up to San Francisco where I grew up. And you can go to Chinatown. And you can go to Golden Gate Bakery. Piping hot dan tat. Just like Hong Kong. Without the protest. 3,381 reviews. Oh, you wait in line one hour. You buy 3,000, not 3,000, <laughs> three dozen dan tat. <laughs> and you don't wait to eat them. <laughs> because you have to eat them hot. <laughs> so you eat all three dozen. <laughs> when you want to eat, you yelp. But when you want to follow God, you don't go where everyone goes. You go against the grain. You go against the flow. You may stick out like a sore thumb. Because when God commands you, when Jesus calls you, when the Spirit of God moves you, it may push us out to the edge. But we can do anything because God is with us. But we must do what He obeys, what he must, we must do what He commands us. Because we are accountable to Him. 
There's a lot of things that can cloud our judgment. But what matters more than the size of our opponent is the strength of our God. Because when we focus more on the faithful Lord above us, then the real and fearful enemies around us, you and I will experience his good promise. Let's pray together. Father, our desire is your people. Is to not only know what you want for us, but to do what you will for us. And Lord, we know that there are times when we are scared. When we yelp our friends and say, What do you think? And then we begin to care more about what others say. And less about what you command. Lord, in those moments, awaken us to you. And help us to live according to your pleasure. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.